All right, how are y'all doing tonight? <laughs> you ready for a lively discussion? <laughs> well, um, you got to see an excerpt of church, and I want to start with a conversation about how you come to write the specific plays that you write. Um, you often mention when you begin a project that you think about the following question. What's the last play in the world you would ever want to write or make? Is that what led you to write church yes. in the house? <laughs> <laughs> um, I grew up in uh, uh, an uh, evangelical Christian household. Mm -hmm. And um, for some reason, starting at a very early age, um, I was uh, resistant, mm -hmm. um, but uh, my parents were new converts, and you know they truly believed that um, you know their child would go to hell uh, if I did not, mm. um, uh, you know, if I if I wasn't uh, a Christian, and so they just put all of their heart and soul into making me a good Christian, and um, I was very resistant. So it was a real struggle in our household, and. Um, uh, and, and so then I went to Berkeley <laughs> and, <laughs> and I just, oh, I remember this heartbreaking story of like, you know, my mother was in the bookstore with me and we were buying my books for college and she just started weeping and I was like, mom, what's wrong? You know, she's like crying in the bookstore and she's just like, I'm just looking at, around at all of these books that are going to tell you that, you know, Christianity isn't true. And um, so... Uh, you know, so, so when I went to college, you know, like I, you know, I told my parents that I wasn't gonna go to church anymore and that was really, that was really, really hard for them. And you know, they, it, it just came, uh, they just came to a point where they realized they had to make a decision. Do we want to have a relationship with our daughter mm. um, or do we want to, you know, keep, uh, or do we, you know, or, or, or do we want this to be a really fraught, um, I mean, I don't know what that is when you just have a terrible relationship all the time, but, yeah. um, but they chose uh, to back off. And, mm -hmm. um, and when I was at Berkeley, you know, like, you know, all my friends were hardcore atheists and we were just, <laughs> you know, it was, it was just like doing a 180, you know, like it was just like, oh my God, you know, like Christianity is so stupid, we're so awesome, you know, like, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and, um, and we were just like very, very smug in our atheism, and um, and and I, and then I, you know, uh, went to grad school at Berkeley, and so that sort of continued, and then um, and then I went to New York to become an experimental playwright, and that scene was not a very Christian scene, either. <laughs> so I sort of, you know, I had like a good long period of time where I just got to feel really good about myself um, <laughs> for not believing in God. And, uh, you know, but then I developed this, this um, sort of masochistic way of making work where I have to come up with the, the last thing I would ever want to do and then force myself to make it. And, um, and, and you know, I really, uh, there were a lot of reasons for why I came up with that. Um, but one of the reasons was um, I wanted to fight complacency um, mm -hmm. as an artist because that was something that had really hurt me when I was growing up, you know, people's complacency um, and thinking they were right about things um, that I didn't agree with. And, um, and I didn't want to be like that. I didn't want to be like that person. And so I was, you know, I was just thinking like, well, what's an area, you know, when I think about, you know, what's an area of my life where I think I'm really great and perfect and, you know, everybody else sucks and is stupid. And <laughs> that area was religion. Mm. And um, so the worst thing that I could think of was to make a show that was um, sort of based loosely around evangelical Christianity, which is what I grew up with, and that was actually targeted at me. Like, I was the target audience. You know, mm. this smug, you know, I'm so better than you, judgmental person out in the audience, you know, and I had to make a show that would just target me at every moment yeah. and not let me have these like good self-satisfied feelings about myself mm -hmm. being so awesome because I didn't have God. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and all my cast members were basically 
that way as well. You know, mm. so we all um, worked together to sort of target ourselves. And I, I have to say, by the end of the show, we were all transformed. You know, like I, um, uh, we all developed uh, a, a new relationship to, you know, spiritual, like the idea mm -hmm. of spirituality, um, to the idea of God, um, you know, to the idea that, um, you know, we're completely self-sufficient as people on our own and we don't need these ridiculous forms of support other people need, you know? Mm -hmm. So we, we were all like really changed by that, by that show, wow. by the process of making that show. But it was, it yeah. was very difficult for me. Wow. I mean, that's amazing because even for us in the room, when we were working on this piece, we, I, I personally, who I'm agnostic, and I, I felt a closer connection to faith. And we talked a lot about our faith and our spirituality in mixed company, which doesn't happen a whole hell of a lot, you know? And so that was really amazing to delve into the work in that way. So, you know, I was thinking about, um, I've had an opportunity to work on several of your plays now, which is amazing. and. I've learned a lot about, in each case, I've learned so much about what I hide behind, um, especially as an Asian American woman, you know, it's so easy to say, oh, like these are all of the glass ceilings and barriers that I am finding along my path. Um, but then to come into contact with a number of other artists and other people, period, who are facing so many other issues as well. And I think, you know, um, very fondly of The Shipment, which is another Crowded Fire production we did of your play. And I remember sitting there in the rehearsal room and we were, we were talking about, oh, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, this is the second part is a living room play, defined as a living room play. And one of the actors raised their hand and said, um, what is a living room play? And I was completely put in my, my place about my own sense of privilege because I just assumed that everybody around the table knew what that meant, you know? And then we did a poll and it was like nobody in the room had ever been in a living room <laughs> play um, as a theater maker, which just um, really was upsetting <laughs> to me, you know? And so, so thank you for making work that allows us to dig deeper in those things. And, um, you, you know, your work often centers around breaking down oversimplification, as you're saying, and our complacency. And um, you've mentioned sometimes that, you, th as you said, you think of yourself as the audience. Um, how, I feel like you're so good at finding the underbelly for so many different audiences around so many different um, identity, you know, uh, questions of identity, and maybe not only identity, maybe many as well other things, but um, how do you find that underbelly? I mean, are you, what is your process like? How do you sort of start to define what is the worst play or the most terrifying play you want to write, you know, or finding that underbelly? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm teaching at Stanford now in the theater department, and I'm teaching playwriting to a lot of students who have never written a play before. And um, this year, I did an exercise the first day of class. It's an exercise I love to do. And um, I basically, I set, um, I set a timer for 15 minutes, and I, I basically ask them to write, to, to think of, like, what would be the most shameful secrets they could write down about mm. themselves and about what they think and about who they are and what they've done and just like just write the most damning possible document that you would that there's like <laughs> not a single human being you would ever want to see that document you know like and I, I'm, I'm like you don't have to read it out loud like you can delete it immediately after you write it but you just have to write something that just cannot be seen by anyone no matter like how close you are to them because it's just that shameful and um so they all, they all do that. Mm -hmm. And then once they're done, um, I say, okay, now I'm gonna set a timer for 10 minutes and you have to revise you know, what you just wrote to the point where like, you can let us all read it out loud. So <laughs> then they frantically go through and like, disguise everything. <laughs> you know? um, uh, and they really, you know, they do a good job. Like you never know, you're like, what is this about? Um, but there is, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there's this, uh, I don't know, like there's just this quality to the writing, mm. always, like every single time. It's never not been the case that there wasn't this like intense, weird somethingness 
to, mm. to that, you know, underneath yeah. um, all of the, you know, the, the, the stuff they put on to hide it. And I feel like, you know, that exercise number one yeah. is sort of what my actors and I do in the process of creating a show, like every rehearsal. Mm. So that's basically how exposed we are about, I mean, obviously not about every aspect of our lives, that's shameful, it's, mm. but, but about this particular topic. You know, if we're mm. talking about race, um, we are just gonna put it all out there. And mm. I tend to um, show by example, you know, so mm. if I'm, uh, if I'm sort of like leading the group and I am just being so, you know, um, open, right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> sharing um, your secrets. <laughs> uh, and, and sharing my secrets, then, you know, like other people, um, it, it just creates an environment where, you know, people start to open up. And so, um, you know, most of my shows, uh, like that underbelly that you talk about mm -hmm. comes from that accessing that place constantly of, you know, like what, um, what am I ashamed of? Uh, you know, like mm. what am I scared? Uh, what mm. scares me about myself? Mm. And then when you talk about you bring, you know, these collaborators and creators together in a room to then look through that under or find more of that underbelly, um, how do you then start to to bring all of that together, especially around a, a, you know, a specific to topic, whether it's church or race, um, and then hold true to your vision of, a pe of that piece? You know, I, I would say that I don't really have a vision for the, like the, mm. the it's, it's uh, you know, like with the shipment, like that was a show about black identity, you know, yeah. so the first day in the room, I basically said, you know, I was like a personal chef, you know, I was like, hey, you're the actors, like, how can I serve you? Like, what kind of play do you want to be in? What sort of characters do you want to be? Like, what topics do you want to address? Like, what do you want to say? I was like, I have really nothing to bring to the table in terms of content. Mm. So I'm just gonna make something that you guys love to perform and that fits your criteria for what you wanna be in. Yeah. And, um, and so I was, you know, I tend often to be sort of in a service position to mm. the actors. Mm. And, um, uh, you know, and, and that's kind of the aim. And um, I don't know, there's just a lot of trust in the room. Mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, like, you know, I have certain, um, you know, aesthetic preferences and, you know, there are things about me that I bring to the table, but in terms of content, mm -hmm. it's really driven by the actors. So I think formally, oh. I will do a bunch of stuff where they're like, you know, like, whoa, like what's happening? What? Huh? Tell us to, like, how do you generate some of that content in the room? Well, I remember during the shipment, um, you know, like every day I would go home and I would like write a scene, because the, the, for the second half of the shipment is like this living room play, which is basically mm -hmm. like a sort of normal play where people resemble human beings and they're sitting in a, on a living room living set room. and, you know, <laughs> yeah. having a sort of normal mm -hmm. drama. And um, so, uh, you know, the cast, they wanted to deal with stereotypes in the show. And I was like, okay, mm -hmm. we can do that for the first half, but I don't want to do that for the whole thing. Like mm -hmm. I want half of it to not be stereotypical. And they were mm -hmm. like, okay, you can write us a play. And they gave me the criteria. They said, these are the characters we want to play. We don't want to be having sex with each other or romantically involved. We don't want to be related <laughs> to each other. Yeah. Um, we want it to be funny. We want it to have some serious content. And they gave, they set out the parameters. And, um, and, 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 and I wanted them to all play characters that, because they had complained a lot about out as actors having to constantly play stereotypes. Yeah. And I was like, well, I want you to come up with a, a non-stereotypical character that you feel like you otherwise wouldn't get cast to play. Mm. So I remember one of them, um, one of the, the men was wanted to be a bulimic cake decorator. Uh, <laughs> you know, he didn't think that he would be like everyone's first choice for that. So, um, <laughs> uh, so, so that was his character. And, um, uh, and another one of the guys said that he wanted to be had a gabbler. So, um, um, so, like, I tried my best to make that type of character <laughs> for him, um, and uh, and so, you know, like every day I would go home and I would write a scene and I would bring it in, and um, uh, and they would they would act it out, and you know, as the scene, so every like they never had any idea where it was going because it was just like whatever would <laughs> pop into my head that night, and I just mm -hmm. remember um, it just became this really fun thing where they wouldn't know what was going to happen, and then all of a sudden something would be happening, and they would all be reacting to it, and yeah. um, the ending of the show, which I will not give away because it's um, yeah. uh, that that was something that I actually threw in as a joke, like that was 
never meant to be in the show because I was just, I like messing with them. Like the, just having oh them be like, whoa. <laughs> like I just loved seeing their reaction of like, whoa, like what just happened? And so I threw it in there as a joke and they were all like, oh my God, we love it. Like you have to keep it in the show. And so oh they, they like, and I was like, no, this is just a joke. That's terrible. And they were, they were like, no, this is, this is how to end the show. And that's why it ended, it, ended that way. Wow, that's amazing. So, so then when you, okay, so you talked about how you go home and you write. And so what is your process when you go home and you're alone and you're like creating this incredible, like muscular, metaphoric and, and provocative language as you heard in church just now? What is your process in that instance? Um, well, I have all of the actors' voices in my head. In, in my head, you know, because like we've just had a rehearsal and they've been like ranting the whole time, you know, about like all the stuff that's on their mind and we've been having this conversation and so their voices are in my head mm -hmm. and I'm just, I guess I'm trying to write something that they're gonna enjoy performing. You know, I guess mm -hmm. that's what's in my head. It's like their voices and their gifts and their abilities specifically as actors, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, what do I wanna see so-and-so do? You know, like mm -hmm. with the, um, you know, if an actor knows how to sing and like loves to sing, like mm -hmm. what song are we gonna give them? And you know, um, uh, sort of playing to their mm -hmm. strengths. And so that's like a real joy that's like a real joy for me, is just to get to sit at home and write for these specific people things that they would wanna say and do, and then I get to go in the next day and they get to do it, and they tell me like what they liked and what they didn't like, and you know, it's, it's really fun. Oh my gosh. And then in a lot of your plays, that explains a little bit about you have different forms. Sometimes you have a song, sometimes there's a dance. Um, when I think about the shipment too, it was like a dance and there was a comedy um, routine and then there was a sketch and then there was a, a song, a cappella song. Like how do you, I am fascinated, fascinated by how you considered the form of it and how you put it all together because there's something about the friction between the different areas of and and pieces of the play that hits you at the end and you're like wow all together this truth came about in my experience um, but how do you come up with that form well in the shipment like the first half was a minstrel show right. like that's why it had all of those elements but like all of my shows have singing and dancing mm -hmm. and comedy like that's I guess that's that's the the me that always gets in there mm -hmm. is the um, I just love that and, and also I just have a short attention span so I just get <laughs> bored like watching people like talk for too long you know and um, and I just want a dance number you know so. <laughs> Well, and you were in a band too, like you created a band, right? That then you also right. have the show, We're All Going to Die. We're all gonna die? We're, we're gonna going. die. We're gonna die. Um, so how did you come about bringing that band together? Oh, that was, that was actually, um, I, I kind of have a, a chill of horror every time I think about the process of making that show because I, um, that was one where I bit off a little bit more than I could chew. Cause like I was, cause I'm a backstage person. Like I do not like, you know, acting or singing or performing or any of that stuff. Like the idea of being in front of an audience, um, like I, uh, that, that's just not my thing. And um, so I thought, well, what is the most worst thing that I could think of? And it was like <laughs> me doing a solo show where I'm like telling monologue after monologue and then I have to sing and dance in between. Like that was just, like that was oh the worst God. thing I could think of. And, um, and it was indeed, every bit it was actually worse than i could have even <laughs> imagined like the you know because like I'm a, I'm a writer and a director like we're not like super physical people like we sit yeah. and we write <laughs> and we watch and like we yeah. eat junk food and like we you know and so and 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 if and when you have to sing and like act and perform and like do all that stuff like you actually have to like realize that you have a body and like take care of your yeah. i hated that Actors i hated that yeah. like oh no yeah. you can't have dairy because it's gonna do something to your and i was just like <laughs> i hate this and um uh and I just remember like before the, oh my gosh, like the first time I ever had to perform in front of an audience, like I have never felt fear like that in my entire life. Like it's so horrifying oh to somebody who doesn't want to be there yeah. to have to do this solo show with all the singing and the dancing and the, you know, it was, it was, it was so, I was just shaking with terror. Like I could barely oh function. And, um, and I performed that show, like just shaking and traumatized through the whole thing. And my friends who were in the audience, they had to turn away because- oh my God. 
they, they couldn't they couldn't look at me because I was suffering so much that uh, they, it was just like too painful to watch. Um, but uh, so, but but then you know, eventually I got used to it, and it didn't happen anymore. But like the horribleness of that experience, like it, I still shudder uh, remembering how scary that was. So not recommended. <laughs> uh, well, you know, but the thing is, it's like now, like stuff like this is much easier because right. I'm like, oh my god, I just have to sit here, like I don't have to <laughs> sing and dance, and you know, I didn't have to train for this. So like oh things gosh. like this are much easier for me now. So yeah. I'm actually glad that I did it, but yeah. it it was really really ter terrible. That's the worst when your voice starts shaking. Oh my god! Like, everybody or, can or tell like you're really or your nervous. hands are shaking, yeah, and you're like, you're what am I gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> you just can't yeah. hide. There's like there's nothing to hide behind. It's a solo oh, show. Oh my gosh. And you did that with your production company as well, right? Yeah. So what's amazing to me is so you had your own production company and um, created a number of different pieces. Um, and your motto for the um, your production company was destroying the audience. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit <laughs> about that and how do you build you know, towards that as you create your piece? Well, I mean, I feel like it's great that you guys did the beginning of church because, like, I felt really bad, like, <laughs> through you know, through that whole opening monologue, you know, because it, it was it was designed to make me feel bad, and I was like, oh yeah, like that 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 worked, um, and uh, and and I was like in tears, like through that whole thing, you know, just because it, you know, it was made to get to me, you know, and like seeing the reverends greet everybody so kindly in the audience, and you know. You know, um, that, uh, that's all stuff that sort of destroys me. So, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's like I try to make work that destroys me um, both in terms of like my complacency and, mm -hmm. um, and just like emotionally. Right. Wow. And then how do you build work? I mean, with your production company, we talked about this a little bit. It's like how has that been different in comparison to now working on Broadway and some of these other, in some of these other ways? You know, I haven't actually, because the, the show that I did on Broadway, Straight White Men, was actually developed with my company and mm. produced by my company first. So I, I have yet to experience the, the process of making a show outside mm. of Broadway. But um, doing a show on Broadway was definitely, um, uh, you know, that, that was also the first time someone else had directed my work, you know, mm. so that was kind of an experiment to see uh, in th that had directed like a New York premiere that I was involved with. Yeah. Because normally, like, I don't, I just try to stay away because I'm such a control freak right. that I feel like my, you know, like it's 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 better if I just stay away from other people's productions um, mm -hmm. so that they can do their do their thing and just help them however they need me to, but just kind of stay out of it because um, I'm really bad with the control freakness and. Um, uh, and on Broadway, I was like, okay, well, let's see if I can, you know, seed seed control to a director, you know, and be in the room and collaborate. And um, the answer was no. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, how did that show up? Huh? What, how did that show up? Well, I, 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 like, I can't speak for the other people in the room because I don't know what it was like to be there with me. <laughs> like, I, I think I, I mean, I, 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 you know, I think I behave myself pretty well. Your but, hands um, were shaking. Huh? No. <laughs> it was just, it was just you know, um, uh, I don't know, I just had this feeling that was just, no, like I need to be the director. Mm. You know, it was just this feeling of, of um, I don't know, like inner certainty yes. of, um, you know, like this is not something that I can do. Right, and you had lived with the piece for a period of time too, yeah. so then to have somebody else step into that role, that must have been. Yeah, and she was very, very, um, uh, you know, uh, she was very, very nice to me, you mm -hmm. know, in terms of, you know, dealing with that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I think I was lucky. Right. Yeah, I right. think um, another director might have killed me. <laughs> yeah. um, 
Well, I want to um, jump back just for a moment in terms of thinking about the audience because we did have a couple questions for the audience and this is part of the thought process you have, I think, as you're making work. So I wonder if we can raise the house lights for a moment just so we can see you all. And, and can I give them a little bit of context yes, about this? So, so, you know, the way that I work with my actors, sort of like asking them what kind of show they want to be in and sort of asking for their feedback, like this sort of extends also to workshop audiences Mm -hmm. and it also like we'll do workshops and then we'll get into a conversation with the audience and then that becomes part of the show and I used to do a lot of um, uh, stuff on Facebook like I actually quit Facebook uh, a few months ago but before that I was very active and I would do a lot of crowdsourcing for my plays. so then Facebook became one of the collaborators on the mm -hmm. show so I think this is one of the questions that I asked on Facebook okay. a while back so you're just gonna get to experience the process I guess Great. is the idea behind it Great, so the first question is, have any works of art ever caused you to take a political action you would not otherwise have taken? If you wanna answer the question, we have folks running around with uh, microphones, and please raise your hand and we'll come on over. Sure, let me repeat it, okay. Have any works of art ever caused you to take a political action you would not otherwise have taken? Yes. Well, I was involved in the protests in Hong Kong um, during the Tiananmen Massacre, mm. so we sang a lot. Um, and, and I'm not really into protests, you know. Um, I was pretty upper middle class and complacent growing up mm. uh, as a teenager, but when I was 16 and for the first time um, I went to protest, you know, the, those were the, the songs were what we, um, I went for. And I remember holding a candle um, that, that burned, you know, till the end and seeing the after image of the candles, mm. even after I'd left the protest and that just kept me going back and you know kept me active. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Anyone else? Yes. Oh, and I see your hand up there. I think that uh, I'm a young theater maker mm -hmm. and making art is inherently political, of course, but um, especially like when I was 18, 19, 20, um, directing a show or acting in a show would introduce me to community organizations that were involved with the themes that we had in the show. So like the vagina monologues or eight. So um, these pieces of art introduced me to uh, local organizations that were helping people yeah. um, and certain causes that I wouldn't have uh, become involved with if it weren't for these pieces that I was working on. Mm. Can I qualify the question? Yeah, absolutely. So, have you ever, uh, have you ever just seen or watched just as a spectator or read mm. a work of art that has caused you to take a political action that you would not otherwise have taken. So, you know, you, you see a movie and you're like, oh my gosh, like I'm gonna go out and do this thing and then you did it. I read um, Maxine Honkingston's Woman Warrior mm -hmm. in high school, and I started the school's first Asian American Student Association. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Great. I think there's a hand in the middle there, the woman with the red hat. I think. Or the person with the red hat. Uh, free Willy, and um, I have been an advocate for the whales. I have a whale tail on my license plate. <laughs> I've uh, written in, um, a children's series on the whales in a spiritual uh, mm -hmm. sense, and um, contributions to um, donate to saving the whales and dolphins in the ocean. It's been um, work and motivated by, by that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I, so, so basically, like this, this has been super informative because mm -hmm. I've actually never received an affirmative answer to that question before. Mm. Um, uh, you know, in whatever, you know, on Facebook, like when, whenever I have, um, uh, you know, talked to people in groups, like this is the, fir these are the first two instances I've mm. heard of someone sort of have, you know, watching or like consuming a work of art and then, and then being spurred to political action. Mm. And, you know, the reason why I ask that question is because um, a lot of my students, mm. you know, they, when they talk about what they hope to do with their plays that they write. You know, a lot of it is like, I hope that I will write this play and then, you know, a bunch of people will read it and then like everything will change in this country. Right. Like people will rise up, you know, <laughs> right. like there will be protests, there will be all of this. And, you know, and what I tell them is, you know, just based on my limited, you know, <laughs> research that I've done, um, you know, among my communities, um, I think that that is not the thing that art is the best at, mm. is getting people to change their behavior. Mm. Um, so, so then my second question is, raise your hand if you have ever experienced a work of art that has changed the way that you think about something. Yeah, ah. and, and that's what I tell them. I say mm -hmm. like, that's, that's the thing that art is good at, mm -hmm. um, you know, which can then, um, you know, which could ostensibly lead to action if it were supported by other, you know, other things. But, um, you know, I, yeah, I tell them that art is really good at making people feel things mm -hmm. um, in a way that makes them look at a subject differently mm. but um you know if you're looking to actually get people on the streets yeah um you know writing a play is not mm. going to be the most direct path to making that happen right yeah i mean in terms of your own work too and your audiences did you ever talk to people right afterwards or did you have some process to gather sort of their response reflections or responses always i mean this reminds me yeah. a lot of it you know like it, we, we would you know we would pr present something in front of an audience that wasn't done and i would just sit up here and talk to them and say like what did you think about this like what did you did you feel this way and then they would give me feedback and i would say well what do you think we should do about this and so it's it's basically mm -hmm. just collaborating with the audience mm -hmm. the way that you do with um the way that i do with the actors or facebook or anyone else mm -hmm. you know it's basically just like what do you think right how do you differentiate or parse through? Because sometimes we'll do a discussion in developing a piece, and I've experienced where different people have very different perspectives on how to approach a situation in the play or whatnot. How do you parse through? Well, in the room with the actors, it's, it's, it's pretty easy because we, you know, we all decide on our goals pretty early on, mm. you know, collectively. So then we all put our personal tastes aside and just focus on that goal. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty easy. You know, like mm -hmm. we, if somebody, a lot of us will just suppress things that we want to say because it doesn't fit the goal that we had de decided on. And when it comes to audiences, you know, audiences, people will say all kinds of stuff, you know, and there will be like a million different opinions. And so what we look for are the overlaps, mm. you know, because you'd be surprised at um, how much feedback you can get from people that does not overlap at all. Mm. Um, so that when there is an overlap and, you know, and sometimes it's like, everyone's like, yes, I had that reaction. Mm. That's when you're like, oh, okay. Like something's happening here. Mm. So that's what I look for is consensus in bigger groups. And then you were going around to different regions of the country with some of your different pieces. So then did you notice regional differences and adjust to those? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, we, we, we tended to get a diverse enough group of people in to see it early enough that we were able to deal with most of those variances. But mm. the biggest change we had to make was when we did the shipment, um, we took it to Europe and the European audiences loved it. And they came up to us afterwards and they said, we think it's like so crazy. We think it's, we love seeing how stupid Americans are about race. Like we're so relieved <laughs> that in Europe, we don't have race problems. Oh. And the cast and I were like, uh, no, like this, this is not. So we actually wrote a whole section into the stand-up yeah. act that was like for specifically for European audiences, oh. so that when you know, so that they would get called out specifically, and they wouldn't be able to say 
race problems are specifically American, and Europe has, you know, s- solved them all. Oh my god! It was it was crazy. People would literally say that, and like really well educated, like lots of people would say that, and we were just like, uh, it's crazy. Oh my gosh! It's like the post-racial America qu- um, conversation. It's like, yeah, ugh, really? Wow. Um, so when you think about how we can change how people think, and you know, what's the last play in the world that you would ever want to write? What is that play now for you? You know, it's the play that has just been kicking my butt for, you know, over a year now. It's been, it's been a long time. Um, I am having a really, really hard time figuring out how to write a play about class because um, we as Americans do not have a vocabulary for talking about class. Like it's, you know, back in the pre-Obama days, we didn't, Americans didn't have a vocabulary really for talking about race. And now we've got like such a sophisticated vocabulary Mm. for talking about race. Like, you know, most people in most parts of the country, like they know, you know, um, you know, they know the lingo, you know, they're sort of familiar with the terminology that gets used, you know, and, um, uh, and there's a way, there's a conversation that's happening Mm. with class we don't have that terminology Mm. you know and we don't have and everything now is very focused on personal identity Mm. and you can't you can't talk about class that way because Mm. people don't identify as poor you know as like a core that's a core part of my identity is that I'm a poor person you know like that or a rich person or a middle class person Mm. you know and there's and so and we just as a society right now have a hard time thinking about things outside Mm. of identity and like who we personally are and how we're perceived and you know and class doesn't fit into that and Mm. so um so i can make a play about class but i'll put it in front of an audience and they think it's about race you know Uh. because just because it's like they can't see it you know Mm -hmm. there's class Mm -hmm. dynamics happening there's conversations happening about class but the audience just doesn't i mean i feel Mm. like you know class has been purposely made invisible in this country so that we don't notice economic Mm -hmm. inequality or or we're, you know, we're not, um, Mm -hmm. uh, or we don't care about it, you know, Mm -hmm. or we think that it's our fault. Like Mm -hmm. we think it's some sort of individual, you know, weakness on our part Mm -hmm. that we are not richer than than we are, you know, and um, I think that that is, I I think that that's, you know, it's, it's probably one of the things that scares me the most about our culture right now is the widening wealth gap Mm -hmm. and you know and you know in san francisco like it's 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 really like you know in this city actually like you can't not see it i mean Mm -hmm. you would you would really have to you know Mm -hmm. um uh uh be deluded sort of beyond you know what in order Mm -hmm. to like think that this 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 city doesn't have you know a a wealth gap um but uh, yeah, that, that is the play that um, I actually do want to write, but I, I haven't figured out how to do it yet. And yeah. I feel like it might just be, you know, because it's like, it's too much work for a play to do to both create a vocabulary, teach it to the audience, mm. and then make a play, you know, and then right. make a play that <laughs> uses that vocabulary, you know, because it's like right now, it's like pretty much anything we do is just over people's heads because we're trained not to see it. Like mm. it's impolite to see it, you know, mm-hmm. it's embarrassing to see it. Like it's mm-hmm. something to be hidden and it's something shameful and, you know, mm. so, um, yeah, so I haven't figured out how to do that yet, but, um, mm. Uh, are you working with collaborators on it? Like, are you also... You know, I've been doing this weird thing where I've been hiring people off of Craigslist to talk to me. (laughs) And so I've talked to, like, a lot of very disenfranchised people in the Bay Area. Um, And, uh, you know, I just... Like last year, it was just like all having phone conversations um, mm-hmm. with people about their lives and um, uh, and their experiences. And um, yeah, so those are sort of my collaborators as of now. But, but the thing is, it's like, you know, um, people say the arts aren't elitist, but, you know, like finding actors yeah. who you know, who live, who currently live in that community, who didn't go to like a fancy college and an acting Mm -hmm. school, you know, like that's pretty, that's pretty difficult actually. Mm -hmm. So, you know, normally the thing that I would do is, you know, is more difficult, right? Like I can't just, you know, um, uh, the people who I talk to on Craigslist, like they haven't had acting training, you know, Mm -hmm. like they haven't, you know, um, so to just throw them into a show would be a complicated, thing you know and and also they have they're supporting not only their 
spouses, but also their kids and their parents, you know, and their spouse's parents. So, you know, in terms of having a lot of free time to go to rehearsal and get paid uh-huh. the tiny amount that, you know, theaters have to pay people is, yeah. Wow. So, so those are sort of the issues. I mean, as you're reaching out to folks off of Craigslist too, is there, a, I imagine there's a weary, weariness or a leeriness that happens too. Like how do they, especially when they think of theater and artists as being elitist in some way, is it easy to talk to them or? Um, they they don't know, like most of them that don't even barely know what theater is. Right. You know, like when I ask them, they're just like, is that, you know, they're like, oh yeah, like I, there was a play at my school at a certain right. point. So I don't think they have any stereotype about me other than that I'm paying mm-hmm. them $50 to talk to them for an hour, huh. to talk right. on the phone for an hour, right. you know, like, um, and uh, uh, yeah, that's. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember t- speaking of Facebook, there was a Facebook question you posted, which was like uh, um, something along the lines, and I'm probably paraphrasing here, or I am paraphrasing here, which is, would you exchange places with someone who has less or no means at all? Or like, if you had a room in your house open, would you bring someone into your house? That's the was question. That, the question? that was the question that you had, which I thought right. was a really good question. You right. know, like, would you bring somebody who didn't have a home into the spare room in your house. Yeah. You know, that is, yeah. And, and, you know, and that's, this is why we don't like talking about class, right? It immediately gets to questions that, that make people uncomfortable, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Are you in, in your um, interviews and are you talking to people who have a lot as well as those who are struggling right now? Yes. And I actually spoke to someone because I, you know, I don't have, I haven't had that much um, experience with the super wealthy. So mm-hmm. I knew somebody who um, knew a lot about, um, uh, who was in the New York super wealthy scene. And they told me, I was like, well, how much money do you have to be, have in New York to be considered rich? And mm-hmm. they told me that the bare minimum is $100 million wealth. <laughs> like, that's barely rich. And this person was like, if I only had 100, and they said this straight faced, if I only had $100 million, I would feel poor. That was like a direct quote wow. from this person. And they said, $500, $500 million is considered like, you know, wealthy, like you're yeah. wealthy. And then if you have a billion dollars, even if you only have $1 billion, mm-hmm. you're like, you're like amazing, you know? Right. So, so um, yeah, the person was like, yeah, you only need to have $1 billion. Like you don't even have to have a hundred billion or 10 billion, just like <laughs> $1 billion is enough to make people go like, whoa, like that person's really rich. Oh um, and uh, yeah, so that was, <laughs> yeah, that was, Ooh. that was eye-opening. <laughs> Did your eyes, would you, like, how do you hide your expression oh, in that was, moment? Oh, it was on the phone, oh, okay. it was on the phone, yeah. Like, it, it's amazing what people will tell you on the phone that they wouldn't tell you, you know, like face to face. But yeah, that was, um, oh, oh, and they told me that um, what the middle class was to them. Like they were like, oh, somebody who's middle class is a banker who didn't, I don't even know the terminology, but like an investment banker who didn't get equity in their company. And so they are like a salaried person who makes like three, you know, $5 million a year or something. And they're like, that's like a middle class person. Like they're useless to us, like in terms of fundraising. Wow. <laughs> I feel like I'm in shock right now. And this is New York. And I have to tell you guys, like, coming from New York, New York is cheap compared to here. Like, yeah. I, I ordered, um, my boyfriend and I, we ordered two pizzas um, the other week, and um, we put them in the cart. And when we looked at the total on the cart, it was $100. And it wasn't from a gourmet pizza place. It wasn't, it was just a regular pizza place, two pizzas, $35 each, medium pizzas. Like, they didn't even have large. It was like $35 each and then there was tax and there was the delivery charge and then there was the tip and it was a hundred dollars total and we like took the pizza out of the cart and we like ate a frozen pizza and we were like we we can't afford to order pizza in this city like it was it was that was crazy in New York like that would never ever happen like you would have to go like you would really have to search to find a place that would charge you a hundred dollars to deliver two pizzas wow so um and rent here is way higher also I mean, when you talk to Bay Area people and you talk especially about the disparity you're seeing, are people mostly aware? Are, is there some denial going on? Is there... I mean, I haven't talked to anybody who's not aware of it. Yeah. 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 Um, oh, hey, five more minutes. Okay, thank you. 
Um, I mean, what are the hardest questions related to the increasing wealth disparity or income disparity? Um, I think, you know, I think the hardest question is always, you know, what are you willing to do about it? Yeah. You know, in, as, as a person, because like ultimately, um, you know, our government needs to make some decisions, you know, about how they're going to allocate resources and taxes and all of that stuff. But, you know, we're the ones who are voting for that, you know, mm -hmm. for voting for, you know, um, to some extent, you know, but also just, you know, like one thing that I, that I focus on a lot is just tipping, right? Like if you don't want to give to homeless people, you know, like a lot of people have an aversion to that, mm -hmm. you know, but it's just tipping. Mm -hmm. Like people, like having worked as a waitress, I know mm -hmm. that people do not tip well. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a real issue. And I think, and so that's something that I can do as a person is to, is to just tip well, mm -hmm. you know, people who are, you know, doing their job, you mm -hmm. know, and they're doing jobs that I don't want to do, like, you know, delivering my pizza mm -hmm. or, um, uh, you know, or, you know, or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, like, so I, you know, I, I don't know. Like, I think, you know, the bigger questions around economic inequality in this country, like, are, you know, I, like, I don't know what I individually can do about that. So I sort of mm -hmm. try to just wrestle with myself on a daily basis, you know, in terms of that question yeah. of like, would you let somebody into your house? Like what, you know, what are you willing to do? Um, and, um, you know, in terms of donating, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, political donations. And, you know, I gave a lot this year mm -hmm. um, to that, you know, mm -hmm. because I, you know, I felt like that was important. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, uh, to me, that's, for me personally, that's the hardest question is like, yeah. well, how do I feel about the fact, uh, uh, you know, about how much this, this dress cost, you know, yeah. or, um, you know, yeah, and if theater changes thought or has a, or art has the opportunity to do that, then what is its place if it's not being heard or if people know what the, the answer is to act, but there's some sort of barrier between the thinking and the acting? Well, the acting, I mean, the, the answer to that question, I mean, what I've learned about what creates action is really community organizing, right? right. Like it's somebody who's a friend of yours saying, hey, you know, like I'm involved with this really cool thing and like, you know, all of these people are involved and like mm -hmm. it, it impacts you, you know, mm -hmm. it impacts your, your kids, like your neighbors, your friends, mm -hmm. and like, why don't you come join us like mm -hmm. on, in this protest or mm -hmm. like, will you do this phone banking or like, you know, mm -hmm. whatever it is, it's people having relationships with each other mm -hmm. and, um, you know, becoming part of a community. Mm -hmm. And that is something that is, um, you know, it, there's a lot of community organizing happening in this country, but it's not really the focus right now. Right, um, right now, the focus is not action. Right now, the focus tends to be, um, uh, I, I don't even know what the word is for it, but mm -hmm. it is, um, Yeah, I don't, it, yeah. it's like, the, the focus is on, I guess, um, on like changing who gets to be in the room and who gets to have a voice mm. um, on a, often on a sort of professional level. Mm. Um, I, I mean, I'm speaking purely in terms of like my social group, which is yeah. like these college educated sort of, you know, artists and academics. Um, I feel like, uh, you know, after McCarthyism, a lot of uh, the, the left sort of went into arts and academia. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of a problem for this country right now because um, arts and academia, like as I, you know, we sort of demonstrated are not the best way to organize people to get them on the streets and get them out there doing things. Mm. Um, so that, uh, and what artists and academics tend to focus on, you know, are, you know, 
talking and having conversations. Right. <laughs> and I guess the question is, is who, we, who are we having conversations and talking with? Right, with each other. Right. You so know, on stage, like in front of, of you know, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, you know, when I, we were talking about intersectionality earlier, like even around race, we're having challenges around everyone starting to really think about all of the different aspects of how we live as a human being instead of breaking it up and fighting in this scarcity model. So I don't know, I was thinking about as an artist, as an Asian American woman, you know, where are we responsible? Because we have our privilege too, our education, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we, I, we were talking about this earlier, like I think we're the next in line to be like the new white people you know, like the same way like Italians became white and, you know, and it's just such a fraught, you know, it's such a fraught question, like, you know, being at the, um, uh, uh, being at the JCCSF, yeah. yeah, being at the JCCSF, you know, like the question of like, are Jews white? Like that mm -hmm. is like, uh, you know, that created like a huge dialogue on Facebook that was probably the most interesting and complicated conversation yeah. that was ever on my wall, you know, that mm -hmm. question. And I feel like if Asian Americans are next in line to become white, like that mm -hmm. is gonna be really complicated also. Yeah, I mean, even as I was looking at some stats around income disparity in the Bay Area, you know, Asian Americans are and Asian populations are much, you know, closer to white populations than definitely black or Latinx or Hispanic, you know, populations. So, I don't know, it's complicated. And I think um, when we, you know, we were talking about affirmative action too, that there has been fighting, infighting that has not been intersectional in terms of a political change and policy change there. So, mm -hmm. I don't know, it will be interesting for us in terms of how we make our work moving forward and where we decide to focus on what our underbellies and our sh where our shame lives yeah. from our people. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I feel like we're kind of coming to a close here. I don't know if there's a last sort of thought you wanted to um, talk about before we take questions out to the audience. Um, I thought that was a great place to end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. <laughs> Great, so at this point we're going to take questions from the audience. So we again have these microphones so we can move the microphones around. If you can raise your hand highly so I can see through the light, ah yes. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Karen Franklin. I'm a high school teacher and writer. I really enjoyed your conversation and your method. Um, I'm wondering a couple things, if I can ask more than one question. Where, where were you raised? Where did you grow up? Uh, a small town in eastern Washington state. Okay, and do you have siblings? No. Uh, and also about your uh, childhood. You mentioned right away that your parents kind of came new or uh, became evangelical later, like they were, after you were little, after you were born. They were so? converted to Christianity by a mission, American missionary um, who came to Korea and went to their and uh, uh, proselytized at their college. So they were converted as Korean college students. Oh, before you were born. Mm -hmm. Okay. For some reason, I had it in my head that because I know people who became um, Mormons by somebody knocking on their door you know, doing that. Mm -hmm. And I thought maybe that had happened to your parents and just because you were interested in religion and going 180, I thought, well, that's interesting if her parents were not religious and then, but that's not the case at all. Great. So, um, and I just wanted to say about class for mm -hmm. myself, I find that class really resonates in San Francisco uh, when I try and go to the museums, and they're so expensive. Mm. And I think about people like Keith Haring, who uh, question who can look at art mm -hmm. by creating art in the New York subways. And just thinking about um, when I was really broke, and like you identifying with wait waiter servers, I give money to poor people or homeless people because I was so broke at one time in my life that having somebody help me was so huge 
that I can identify with that moment of helping somebody when they really need it. So making that really personal makes me really appreciate the struggle that they're going through. So anyway, thank you thank so you much. So much. Appreciate that. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you for sharing. And are there questions? I want to make sure we have questions. Uh, yes, the gentleman in the. Oh yes. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi, I'm Evren. Um, uh, I miss you on Facebook, I should say. <laughs> um, some of the most interesting conversations I got to watch were because I was you know, friends with you on Facebook. Um, but the thing I found really interesting about the Facebook conversations was um, you would ask a very neutral question and there would usually be a huge amount of anger that would just come up and I was always really interested in the way you engaged with that anger in this digital way. I'm really curious about your way of dealing with that, if you're dealing with it in the room. So if you're making work and dealing with race and somebody says something and you know when that kind of tension happens in the room, what are some ways in which you work through that? Because you were amazing at it on the internet. Mm. Um, I think you know, in the rehearsal room, that's a, that's a sort of unusual space because we're, there's so much trust and we're so close and we're working so closely with each other. So I've never actually experienced that kind of rage in a rehearsal room. But um, on Facebook, you know, like as somebody who grew up with a lot of racism, um, I get triggered very easily. So I have this sort of uh, PTSD type of temper that will just come out of nowhere um, when certain sensitivities are, are set off. And um, so when somebody does that to me, I sort of understand what that is. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of empathetic to, to where that's coming from. Like it's, it's coming from a place where like they were very hurt by something and they feel like I'm trying to do that to them again. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I found that if you treat somebody who's lashing out with that sort of empathy and understanding, like they, like they, they just immediately, um, uh, you know, will engage with you in a real conversation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because it's like they're attacking because they, they think that, you know, you want to destroy them. Mm, right. Great. Um, there's a question to the right over there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, between directing your work at the public and then it going on Broadway when you finally did see another director do the work, what was the differences, um, that, and, and how was it interpreted differently than what you did at the public? Um, it wasn't that different because, <laughs> because, because I, I was so involved in the process. <laughs> um, yeah, as I said, the director was very nice about it. Thank you, we have a question to the left over here. Great, thank you. Hi. Um, First of all, I just want to say I've had the pleasure of teaching your work, oh. um, and Thank one of my you. students ended up doing a master's thesis on your plays. Um, wow. My question is about uh, the word experiment. Uh, obviously, you embrace mm -hmm. it. You include it in your, your bio. What does it mean to you to be an experimental theater artist? And the second part of that is, who do you see experimenting right now that are pushing boundaries further than you have? Mm. Um, uh, well, to me, experimental basically just means anyone who's not doing strictly living room plays. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, it's like, it's a pretty, a pretty low bar to qualify as that. Um, and I think that, you know, I have students who are, um, you know, I, I have students who are pushing the boundaries like further than I did. Mm. Um, and they're sort of carrying on this tradition of experimentation and like taking it further. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, I, you know, I think, I think a lot of people are experimenting right now. Mm. Great. I have a question in the middle here. Yes. Hi, um, are you clear about what your purpose is and what you're wanting to do? Cause you keep mentioning 
um, you want to take call of action and your, um, your topics are so large and the medium is an experience. So um, from this exposure, you have a combination of farce, comedy, and it's very confusing. And if you want, and um, without knowing who your target audience is in a ver very scarce uh, um, population on this huge topic, it gets delusional for somebody to follow if you're not clear, and I'm trying to figure out what that is, because call of action has to provoke a union of uh, understanding. Right. Well, what I'm saying is that I don't think that my, my, my art is a call to action, um, and that I don't think that, uh, and that I think that's something that's very difficult for art to do, to call people to action. And the, the more experimental work that I've done was for a very specific audience. I think you're correct that it was for a very specific small audience of people who are into experimental theater and who tend to be funded by Euro Euro European money. Um, and, uh, you know, I would tour my work all over the world and everywhere I went, the audiences tended to be the same sort of like college educated, very, you know, artsy uh, audiences who were into experimental theater. So, I, I mean, I think you're absolutely correct that uh, the work that I've made is for an incredibly narrow audience um, uh, of people who would even be able to see it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have time for two more questions. There's one here, one over there. I want to invite everyone to join us in the atrium afterwards for a reception. And thank you, you two. Second to last question. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here. Um, I'm an actor, performer, visual artist, and writer as well. Um, worked very closely with Crowded Fire um, oh, cool. for several years. I am just, the question is for you, but but the question that's been going through my mind since you started talking about class is why I started becoming incredibly uncomfortable um, with the idea of the invisibility of class and the class vocabulary. I took a, an Uber over here myself and actually had, like the second I got in, this woman happened to have a slice of pizza, uh, a pizza pie, and I was like, ooh, that smells good, and then the driver's like, $5 a slice. And then I was like, you know what? <laughs> I don't, I don't, and then, and then it went up to eight, and I was like, you know what, nah, I don't, I don't buy any pizza that's less than $15. You know? <laughs> Just as a continued joke, but uh, I, was, I was gonna meet Everin over here to, to maybe get a bite of food, and I, I went to the deli, I went to the supermarket, and they're charging fucking $15 for like, however many ounces of potato salad. Like, that's, that's so classism right there, and I mean, Pacific Heights is right up here, you know what I mean, but it's like, yeah. bam. It's, it's right in your face, it's right in my face, and, and I feel like I'm this weird yin-yang to you right now because I'm also, I'm Asian, American, Middle Eastern, but West Asian, Iran, you know, it's all Asia. Um, and uh, I, I'm just like, I feel really uncomfortable. It might be because I had an almond latte and I just had too much <laughs> coffee in my system. But I, I disagreed with everything that you said from the second you started talking about class because I feel like, and, and even art as a call to action, because I feel like the only salvation for the country and for people to realize and have some form of transcendent abstract awareness to really like viscerally affect people is only through art. That's the only way to change people. And of course they might not directly realize it, but why would you even be sitting here saying that you don't, th I, 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 I don't, I, I mean, you, you talked a lot about self-identity and, and maybe that kind of being a core element of your, your, your work in, a, in an existential kind of way, but why would you be sitting here thinking that what you're doing is not a call to action? Because, yeah, there may be a limited audience in here, but you don't make work for any other reason almost rhetorical question. I just, I, I, I don't get it. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, I think that you make a good point. I mean, I, I feel like I actually agree with you that art does have tremendous power to change people. Um, all I was saying that just practically speaking, um, art is not usually the thing that gets somebody out on the street. I mean, like, I, I mean, at least as far as I can tell from my conversations with people. Um, so, 
Uh, so I was not saying that art has no impact on people. I was saying that art is not the thing that creates action, and that is actually like a sort of problem in the left right now, that we're missing a piece, right? We've got the academia, we've got the arts, we've got the left populating, you know, you know even Hollywood now is, 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 uh, is getting on board, uh, you know, with diversity. Um, uh, but, like, I think that, uh, you know, I, all I'm saying is that I think that we're missing the piece of mobilizing and organizing communities to actually get out there and act. Um, you know, in, and, and what that action would take, whether it's protest or whether it's withholding labor, like, I don't, I don't even know what that looks like because I have just been brought up in this sort of womb of, you know, leftist, academia and the arts, and that's all I know. And I'm sitting up here because, you know, this is what it means to be, you know, this is what it means for a lot of people to like be on the left mm -hmm. in the US right now, is to, you know, make art because you're an artist and you, you, you make art. Like, I mean, I, I make art because I can't help it. Like, that's who I am. Like, I would, I don't know what I would do if I didn't make art, you know, like I have to do that. And, um, you know, and, and I think that you are asking me a very good question of like, what am I even doing up here? I mean, I think that's the question I'm asking myself. Like, that's the kind of question that is, uh, that would make, you know, that would be the good basis for a show, actually. Like, what are we doing, Mina? <laughs> like, what are we doing let's here? Let's sing a song. <laughs> <laughs> let's get a band together. <laughs> be, yeah, I don't know. I feel like that's a question I ask myself weekly, if not daily. You know, because we still have it in our hearts that we want things to change, you know, and that we want to act. We just don't know always what that action is or how to make it happen or how to make big groups of people do it all together. Well, and I wonder actually if it's a network that no, we can't all be great at all the things. And so it's actually a network of mutuality and that instead of trying to, I, th I think we just have to work closer together with other people who can mobilize people who you know bring the art in their sphere and then have them do the things that they're great at um, and learning about social justice collective movements and like you know but we can't do in the number but of hours there are in a day you know? i know but this is the thing it's like we used to be the left we used to be the ones who did that stuff yeah. it's just all of our training is in academia and the arts. so like every artist i know is like that's not my strength and i'm like well that's not your strength because you've never done it yeah. You know, you would, you know, you would be a kick-ass organizer, you know, like, <laughs> you, you just don't have time. Like, I would yeah. be a kick-ass organiz organizer, yeah. probably, you yeah. know, like, if I had the training and the experience. Well, maybe it has to be 50-50, I mean. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I, I mean, like, the, the best answer that yeah. I've heard is, like, parallel tracks, but again, I'm with you, like, in yeah. terms of how much time you have and how little funding there is in the arts, and, yeah. you know, so it's, it's a complicated issue. Like, I'm not saying it's, it's simple. I'm just saying, for me, it's complicated, and I, I reflect you know, I, the question you're asking me is the question I'm asking myself. Mm. Cool. Question up top here? Yes. Hi, so thank you so much for coming here and challenging us and provoking us into deeper exploration of politics and, and life and all that. So the, the question I have for you is about your own consumption of art. So who do you consider to be your peers? What do you like to watch? Uh, what do you like to read? Who are the playwrights that, that you're paying attention to or the directors who fascinate you? Oh, I, I always hate answering this question because it's Sorry. videotaped and, like, and then I have to leave names out that I forgot always. And it's like, no, it's not that I don't think they're good also. Okay, so just whoever pops into my head, the, uh, Jackie Sibley's Drury yes. just did a show called Fairview that was yes. quite revolutionary in New York. Um, and uh, like I'm trying to think, the Underground Railroad Game oh, um, by Jennifer yeah. Kidwell and uh, Scott Shepard. Mm -hmm. um, that was also uh, really, really great in New York. Um, uh, and maybe you don't have to say who, but what kind of work? Maybe that might be an easier question to answer. I mean, I think that there is, I mean, I don't, I mean, to be completely honest, like, I'm not really about theater right now. Like, you know, yeah. for me personally, because I really have, I'm, what I'm struggling with, it's hard for me to like, 
be enthusiastic about theater in this moment just because of, the, of its inaccessibility to wider groups. You know, that's something that I have been struggling with for, I, I would say, like the past five years, is the fact that if you make a movie, anyone can Netflix that. Mm. You know, if I make a show, like who, who can see that? Who's gonna have access to it? Like what groups am I, am I making work for? And if you go mm. into like any New York, almost any New York theater, the audiences will be like all almost entirely white, um, almost entirely, you know, over the age of 60. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's, these are not diverse theater audiences and these are the people, these are the audiences whom, you know, um, uh, who are the loyal, devoted ticket buyers who will come and who will show up for the work, you know? And so then the question um, arises of like, who are you making the work for? So I'm, um, I'm very confused about theater at the moment because what I see is I see a bunch of middle-class, college-educated people who went to fancy schools and got taught at Stanford by people like me, um, mm -hmm. going out and, um, you know, buying lattes and writing plays in Starbucks and, um, <laughs> uh, and getting them produced. Like, that's, that's what I see. So it's hard, it's, it's, it's uh, yeah. It's, it's hard, a little hard for me to be enthusiastic about that. Like when I've spent the past year talking to people who, you know, who like can't afford electricity, you know, like it's, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's a confusing time for me. So it's a hard question for me to answer. Mm. Um, I, oh, but I do know that there are communities, um, there are lots of communities throughout the US. I know that there are a lot of communities in Chicago where people from, um, uh, where artists, are basically saying, you know, I, I invited, like I was trying to, di I, I did a show at Steppenwolf Theater in Chicago, mm -hmm. and um, I wanted a more diverse audience, so um, I got them to let me give free tickets to, uh, you know, various theaters of color in the area, and I wrote to them, and they wrote me back such, such a nice email. They all got together, and they wrote me back an email that was so nice, and it basically said, you know, we really thank you for this invitation, and we really, um, you know, and, and, and we really appreciate that you reached out to us, but we can't Set, set foot inside a white supremacist institution. And I was like, what? Oh, like, wow. what? how is it a white supremacist institution? And they said, oh, because it was founded by and for white people and it pre predominantly serves white people. And I said, but, you know, the playwright downstairs is black and I'm Asian American. And they were like, it doesn't matter. Like, we make theater um, for our communities. Within our communities, we don't ask for funding from white supremacist organizations, like wow. we don't need them. Like we are doing our own thing, we're serving our community, and we, you know, and we are filling, packing our houses with people in our neighborhoods and, you know, managing to fund it all ourselves. And so I would say right now, like when I think about who I'm inspired by, I'm inspired by the people in those communities. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. That's all the time we have tonight. Audience, thank you for participating with us tonight. Please join the reception. Thank you, Young Jean and Mina, for taking us to church. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much.